Hello and welcome to a very special, unique edition of Steam Locos in Profile. Can we zoom out a bit, please? A bit more. More than that. More than that. There we go. OK, we're going miniature and we're going to find out who's best. Full steam ahead. Oh, come on, it could be worse. You could be watching Train Spotting Live. These men and women are not amateur toy train enthusiasts. They are skilled model locomotive engineers. Well, apart from this bloke. And for one weekend a year, the best of the best come together for this, the International Model Locomotive Efficiency Competition. It's the ultimate test of power, speed and fuel economy, albeit on three and a half inch and five inch gauge. Each contending loco will be given a chosen amount of coal, its trailing load will be measured, and then it'll run as far as possible against the clock while its performance will be monitored. The engine that's the most thermally efficient will be the winner. This event has been held every year since 1969, except when there was a world health crisis, obviously, taking place at different miniature railways each time. This year, the trials are being held at Moat Park in Kent, home of the Maidstone Model Engineering Society since 1949. It's a fantastic circuit, this 1,826 feet of three and a half inch and five inch gauge track. It usually takes about five minutes to get round here, but a non-stop lap at eight miles an hour takes around two minutes and 36 seconds. Now that might not sound very fast, but on this scale, eight miles an hour is equivalent to 90. So let's have a quick look at the circuit. Once you start off from the station straight, past yards on either side, a 50-foot left-hand bend takes you up a 1 in 600 climb. After slewing through 180 degrees, our contestants negotiate a bridge up 1 in 150 before diving behind some trees. Continuing to rise at 1 in 100, the line steepens to 1 in 80 at the top of the circuit, past long weeds and trees on either side, and negotiating kamikaze squirrels along the way. Around a balloon loop at the top, our competitors enter a cutting where they're rewarded with a sudden change of 1 in 200 uphill to 1 in 50 down. Rapidly descending at 1 in 100 again, each engine can make up whatever time they lost on the way round before they arrive back where they started. Now you may think that efficiency and steam locos don't go hand in hand. They run on coal, they take ages to prepare and dispose, so to some people this is all a bit pointless. But here and now in the 21st century, we're seeing climate change activists, legislation over carbon emissions and lower availability of fossil fuels. So to keep steam traction alive for as long as possible, monitoring efficiency could become all the more important in the future. But maybe not in this case, because this is more for fun. So let's see how our contestants get on. First up is a B1. There were 410 of these LNER 460s built between 1942 and 52, and this is one of three taking part in the competition, entered by Guildford MES representative and professional gardener Matt Butler. This actually belongs to my club. Um, it used to be belong to Paul Tompkins, and he, he wanted to get rid of it or we'll sell it on to he moved down to Devon. So the club was after a new, better pastoral engine and we looked into it, had it on trial for a month, gave it a few public runs and us as a club decided to buy it to boost our loco stock and obviously help us you know, for public days at our club. It's my first time doing this competition so I don't really know what to expect. I guess you just take it as it comes and see, see how we go. Each contestant has 30 minutes to do as many laps of the track as possible. They'll be hauling this specially made dynamometer car, which is basically a wagon stuffed with measuring equipment, as part of their train load. This one will measure the engine's speed, distance travelled and load on its drawbar. The judges will then measure the results against the amount of coal that Matt's B1 has burned. 
our contestants will be burning Welsh anthracite coal, which is more compact and carbonated than normal bituminous coal, but it also burns hotter and more economically than other fossil fuels. But with the last coal mines in Britain due to close very soon, it could also be the rarest in years to come. To make sure there's no cheating, our contestants will also have someone behind them to observe their firing. For this run, Matt's B1 has taken on two pounds of coal and has 13 passengers on his train behind the observer. One last addition of coal to the fire, the signal shines green, and he's off. Imlek 2021 is underway. The first curve out of the station is up a gentle 1 in 600 gradient. But as it's the first run of the day, the track isn't completely dry, so straight away Matt's engine is struggling to make it up the climb. Three times Matt's engine has to back down in order to try another run at the hill, even dropping off passengers as he goes. The rules state that you can drop passengers if you're struggling to start again, but once those passengers are off, they can't get back on again. What's more, contestants who stand still for eight minutes will be out. So the pressure's on Matt to get his engine round the track. But even half a train load is too much for the slippy B1. Eventually, Matt's engine runs out of time and has to be given a push back to the shed. Driver is turning up It's a shame to see the first engine retire, but at least Matt did what he could. So that was our first attempt. Let's see if this North British Railway Atlantic, entered by Beechhurst Miniature Loco Society member Michael Porter, has better luck getting round the circuit. British built 22 of these H-Class 442s between 1906 and 21 to the design of William Peyton Reed. Sadly, they were all withdrawn in the 1930s and none have been preserved. We weren't able to interview Michael, so we can't tell you much about this loco, but we were able to find out that the boiler paperwork indicates it was built around 1987. Contestants can use as much water as they like, but stopping for water and starting up again can waste precious coal, so Michael has to collect his on the move, TPO style. contestant gets 30 minutes, but if their final lap isn't finished when the time is up, they get an extra 5 minutes to complete their run. He only had 3 people behind the observer, but Michael's Atlantic was able to travel 16,634 feet without stopping on 2.4 pounds of coal.
So, the first completed run of the event reveals that the North British Atlantic from Beechhurst achieved a thermal efficiency of 0.4458%. Well, that's a start at least. Next up is a Britannia, one of two in this year's contest, entered by Gravesend representative Carl Midgley. However, when we arrived to interview Carl, fellow Gravesend member Andy Healy was entering Carl's loco on his behalf for reasons that none of us were expecting. He died this morning. So my condolences. My sister has asked me to run it for him. So fingers crossed, I'll give it a good run round today. He started building it when he was 16, while he was at college, learning to be an engineer for Dartford Power Station. It took him a few years to build, and he's done a couple of Imlex with it. I did spray it blue for him, because <laughs> he wanted it blue, same as Tornado, so. Mm -hmm. I just want to run with a few people, a few family members, um, because it's my first Imlex, and do my laps. So, well, best of luck to you. Okay, thank you very much. We were going to make a joke about our experience of Britannia's being unreliable. But given the circumstances, we just hope that Andy can give Carl a good send-off. The original Britannias were the first locomotives built in British Rail's standard range of 999 steam engines. Built as mixed traffic express passenger locos, 55 were built and two have survived into preservation. The full-size Britannias were claimed to reach speeds of up to 100 miles an hour, and with Andy at the regulator and eight passengers behind his observer, this one was flying! At the end of its run, Carl's Britannia had burned slightly more coal than the Atlantic, but it completed more laps with more people behind the observer. And straight away it shot into first place with a thermal efficiency of 1%. Only time will tell how long it stays at the top. Now, if you don't recognise this 260 in full-sized form, that's because this is a freelance design popular with model engineers. It's known as a Poly, simply because it was designed by Poly Engineering, and entered by Dave Shepard. No relation. Dave's chosen payload is three passengers, and he's taken on two pounds of coal. So how will he do?
promising start, but after just three laps, the Polly has had to stop to build up more steam. It's not just a case of piling endless amounts of coal on the fire. Dave has to make sure it burns hot enough for his Polly to generate enough steam to start up again. What's worse is, with less than 10 minutes to go, Dave is forced to ditch his passengers in order to start up again. With less than 90 seconds to go on his run, Dave decides not to take his engine any further. It's only run 9,564 feet across five laps. But the judges have declared the Polly has completed its run and beaten the Atlantic, so it's now in second place. It's mostly been Eastern, Standard, and neither of those things going on here. So here's one from the Southern Railway, a Maunsell U-Class 260, entered by famous American music composer, I mean, Southport MEC member, John Williams. Well, the, the local was bought by Ben Pavia in, on May 12th, and he bought it uh, as a running loco, but then it turned out that it wasn't a running loco, so we ended up having to strip it. As his business is, is uh, building engines for people, it was on the back burner, and on the back burner, and on the back burner, and then it was getting a month, and then we end, and then I was like, well, I'll enter it for a laugh. It's quite reassuring to see John's U-boat complete, to be honest, because the photo he submitted with his application was that. So at least he's feeling confident. More confident than we imagined. We were told the engine's valve gear had been set on a bench at a motorway service station on its journey down to the track that morning. So the loco hasn't had a chance to run in yet. And it shows. <laughs> Initial testing reveals the engine seems a bit tight. But John's going to give it a go anyway. So let's see how he gets on. The original Maltzel U's, dating from 1928, were the Southern Railway's prime mixed traffic locomotives throughout the 1930s. The timing may be out of beat and the cylinders may have thrown half an ocean out of the chimney, but John's last minute loco puts in an excellent first lap and makes good progress for the second. But any marathon runner would tell you that keeping up momentum isn't as easy as it looks. Just short of the summit, John's engine runs out of steam and he has to run all the way back to the start to ditch his passengers and have another go at it. Now performing much better, the U manages to complete another three laps of the track. But in the end, John decides to finish his run with just under two minutes to spare. He's run 9,347 feet on 1.4 pounds of coal. And it hasn't done as well as the Atlantic, just 0.2609% efficient. 
So far, all of our entries have been 5 inch gauge, but let's see how the first of our 3.5 inch gauge entries gets on. From Mike's Models of Birmingham, Steve Harrison with his entry, an LMS Black 5, which is referred to on this gauge as a Doris. The loco was built by Don Crisp um, back in the uh, sort of mid, mid 60s um, and then had quite a lot of uh, running. It was reboilered um, sort of mid 70s when the original boiler failed on it and then it run for a good few years after that and then uh, it was slung under his workbench for a, for a good few years and then his grandson showed an interest in the loco so uh, it was dug out, given a little bit of TLC and uh, put back into service. Um, Don passed away back in 2008 um, which was when I acquired the loco and uh, been running ever since. So how do you hope to get on today? Hopefully we'll finish. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's always a good uh, a good good start, but um, but no, I mean we're not going to be pulling any uh, heavy loads with it, but uh, as long as we, we can finish, and uh, that's, that's that's the aim of today. Steve's engine is by far the smallest in the competition, and you might assume that means it would use the least amount of coal. But with smaller driving wheels, his Doris has to work much harder to keep up the pace. Needless to say, Steve has nobody travelling behind his observer. <laughs> After four laps, the engine has been pretty consistent. But somehow Steve has managed to run out of steam going downhill on his fifth lap. His Doris has had to stop for a blow up. After 26 minutes and 10 seconds, the Doris has had its day. It's only covered 9,274 feet and burned more coal than John's bigger U-Class. So it's gone to the bottom of the leaderboard, just 0.0603% efficient. Another 3.5 inch gauge entry, and it's another pre-war southern type, entered by another Southport member. An S15 entered by HGV driver Andrew Pope. The regulator is very, very sensitive. Um, I mean, stop the flag out, very sensitive. So. Um, I cheat a bit by using the drain cocks when pulling away with it slipping. Um, so the only weak link really is me. <laughs> so how do you hope to get on? Um, if I can run for 25 minutes, I'll be very, very happy. The S15s were more powerful than the U's in service and reportedly faster by some accounts. But scaled down on this track, Andrew's S15 may have to work much harder to keep up with the pace of John's U. How will that affect his result? Well, it's already off to a difficult start. He's only a quarter of a lap into his run and Andrew's S15 is really struggling to grip the rails. Halfway up the incline, the train has slipped to a stand. And after more than five minutes standing still, it looks like the S15 could be out. But back at the station, an investigation reveals that it's not the S15 that's the problem. The weld between this and the round. A weld on the dynamometer car's foot support has broken. It's catching on the track and slowing Andrew's engine down. The S15's not at fault, but what will the judges think? Um, we've got two spare slots tomorrow anyway where people drop out. So right. either five o'clock tomorrow night evening or nine o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I don't know which one I'd have yeah. The nine o'clock or the five o'clock? I'd be going the five o'clock. Well, that's, so that's, that's the one I was thinking about as <laughs> yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. You've, got, you've got a nice hotel bed tonight. There you are, yeah. well, five o'clock tomorrow then. Yeah, that's fine. So the S15 will get another chance later on, while the dynamometer car will be fixed. 
And so back to the eastern region, with the first of two northeastern railway Raven T2s, known as netters on this scale, competing today. And wouldn't you know it, another member of Southport MEC, Festiniog and Welsh Highland Railway engineer, Danny Haywood. In his day job, Danny usually maintains two-foot gauge South African garrets in North Wales. But will that give him the upper hand in this competition? The T2 was a heavy freight design by Sir Vincent Raven. Introduced in 1913, the class totaled 120 members over eight years. Later classified Q6 by the LNER, the whole class was fitted with superheating before the grouping. One of the Q6s survives at the North Yorkshire Moors Railway, but Danny's example represents the class in its original saturated form. Don't forget, after 30 minutes are up, our contestants have an extra five minutes to finish their final lap. Danny's engine finishes in 32 minutes and 16 seconds. He didn't have any passengers, but he only burned less than one pound of coal and traveled 14,831 feet. So he's done better than the Doris and even the U but not better than the Atlantic, so Carl Minchley's Britannia is still in the lead. Ah, now this could be interesting. A Grizzly A4 Pacific Wild Swan from the Chesterfield and District Model Engineering Society, entered by retired engineering supervisor Roger Holland. I built two more before this. I built a Simplex and I built a, a Grizzly uh, V3, three-cylinder tank engine, and I was talking to my grandson, and uh, I said, no, Joe, I'm going to build a, a BR standard tank next. Oh, granddad, not another tank engine. <laughs> I says, okay, he says, go and fetch a book then, and have a look through the book and tell me what you think. So, and, and he came up with this, build that granddad. And I looked at him, a bit old-fashioned, you know. I said, well, go on then. We'll, have a, we'll give it a go. So, I did. It took four years. Thing is, though, it's efficiency that's key here, not speed. In fact, the rules clearly indicate that the speed limit on this circuit is 8 miles an hour, which is about 90 when you scale it up, and any contestant that breaks that limit three times will be disqualified. Still, 90 miles an hour is cruising speed for an A4 in reality, so let's hope Roger can hold his engine back. passengers behind his observer, Roger's engine has quite a load to pull, and while he's going well, he doesn't seem to be going quite as fast as Carl Minchley's Britannia.
Avengers A4 covered 16,685 feet in 33 minutes and 15 seconds. But he's burned nearly three pounds of coal, more than half a pound more than the Atlantic. But he has pulled twice as much weight in the process, so Rogers A4 has at least beaten the North British Atlantic and the Polly. Gresley's finest is currently second best. Will it stay there? From the fastest steam locomotive on the LNER, back to one of the slowest, in theory. Another Northeastern Railway T2, this time in 5-inch gauge, entered by groundsman Harry Wilcox of the Ickenham and District Society of Model Engineers. If Danny's smaller netter is anything to go by, this one might be even more efficient because it shouldn't need to work quite as hard to keep up the pace. But let's see. <laughs> Harry's T2 is putting in a promising performance. With four people behind the observer, it's running like clockwork. Five laps into his run, Harry looks like he could put in a good result. But then... Locomotive has done a tangmere and dropped a conrod. It's a disaster. One of the coupling rods that links the driving wheels together has been thrown off at one end, causing the whole loco to jump off the track. The rest of the engine isn't badly damaged, but repairs can't be made in time to finish the run. Harry and his team have no choice but to retire. Harry and his engine limp back to the shed, receiving a hero's welcome. We had, uh, we had a bit of fun there. It was a strong start, but Harry's T2 is out. The leaderboard remains unchanged. Back to the last of the three and a half inch gauge entries. An LMS Princess Coronation Pacific, the only British steam locomotive design that could get up the A4's nose, so to speak. But does Tiverton representative Paul Tompkins have high hopes of topping the competition? It was built by a chap called Ian Jameson in the wheel. I think she's about 20 years old. My late father tried buying her, I believe, in 2005, but got pipped at the post. And I managed to find her way up in the north of Scotland about two years ago. So with the help of a few good friend of mine, we managed to get hold of her and slowly got her back in second and get her running again. She should do quite well, but you just, you must never turn up to Wimlek thinking you're going to do well, so yeah. it can um, bite back at you. Given the Princess Coronation's history, Paul's had every reason to be quietly confident. Now in reality, the Princess Coronation was at one point the fastest steam locomotive in Britain for about a year and four days. But let's see if Paul's smaller Duchess can beat Roger's A4 at efficiency. He's only got two people behind him, so he's got a quarter of the A4's load, but the rain has started to settle in. City of Chester is still performing like a real Stania thoroughbred should, but not for very long. After just one lap, the Duchess has slipped to a stand and has to drop both passengers in order to start again. 
but after restarting, City of Chester manages to perform more consistently, but maybe not quite as well as first hoped. And after 26 minutes and 54 seconds, he's only covered 8,725 feet, the lowest distance in the contest so far. But in his favor, he only had two people on board and only burned 0.8 of a pound of coal. So with those figures, Paul's Duchess has beaten all the three and a half inch gauge entries. But the smaller scale means that he's had to work much harder than Roger's A4, which means once again the West Coast has lost out to the East. Over the hump with the B1s, the second of three in the competition, also representing Southport MEC, entered by house fitter Marcus Peel. I bought the Loka about four or five years ago. He was an ex Leyland member. I've had new bobbins done and new piston rings. Entered a couple of times in the MLAC. I've done, I think, I've come fifth or fourth in the Burning of Mon in 2018. Presumably, you're hoping to do quite well this time. Hopefully, it'll be good. Is that the right one, yeah? Yeah. Okay, you happy with that? In fact, Marcus's B1 came first in the 2019 MLAC competition. So this is one to watch. The B1s were arguably Edward Thompson's most successful locomotive design, and it looks like Marcus has been much luckier than the B1 we saw earlier. Marcus's B1 has travelled 16,605 feet with seven people behind the observer, and he's only managed to burn less than 1.6 pounds of coal. It's looking good, and it is good! With a thermal efficiency of 1.1289%, the B1 has taken the lead from the Brit. Now to one of the most technically advanced of the freight engines in the contest an LNER Gresley P1282. There were only two of these built in 1925 for heavy coal trains and lasted barely 20 years in service. And this one comes from Jeff Moore of the South Holland Society of Model Engineers. That's the district of South Holland, by the way, not the country. They are heavy mineral engines. They were constructed primarily to take 100 coal wagons from New England Yard at Peterborough down to Fern Hall in London. They would take that load down one day and then the following day they would bring another 100 wa empty wagons back up to Peterborough. The thing which is unique about the engines is that they have a booster. The booster is a little two-cylinder engine which drives the wheels underneath the cab. On the model it, it, it is a working booster. I decided to make it operable by using compressed air. I have to use a pump to pump up a tank which is hidden under the back of the tender to give me a, a compressed air reservoir which then operates the various valves and cylinders to operate the system to put it into operation. The P1's original tractive effort was £38,500 but with the booster it increased to £47,000. Mind you, it's just as well that Jeff's one runs on compressed air because the original boosters just wasted fuel. Jeff's engine is one of three locomotives in this competition to come with three cylinders. So let's see what advantage that gives him as he takes on an impressive 10 passengers. Maybe a finely built scale model, Sorry, but oh you. no! The tenders come off on the first lap! Perhaps the scale is a little too fine. 
Jeff manages to restart his loco, but during his run, the tender managed to derail another two times. couldn't get much worse, Jeff has had to stop on lap four. He's managed to restart again, but with seconds to go, Jeff's P1 has only done four laps of the track. So he's making the most of his extra five minutes and going for another lap. In 34 minutes and 22 seconds, the P1 burned one pound less coal than the A4, but it only covered 9,274 feet. So while it did better than the Poly and the Atlantic, Gresley's heavy freight Mikado has finished behind his thoroughbred Pacific. Now for a heavy freight engine from home territory, a Riddles WD-210, built by Graham Taylor and entered by his son, Nick. Sadly, Nick's father passed away in January 2021, so Nick is running this engine in his honour. Win or lose, the Maidstone representative is sure to do his best. There were 150 of these 210Os built during World War II, and when a smaller 280 version was trialled against some Eastern, Midland and Western equivalents in 1948, it proved more efficient than all of them. The exhaust sounds really impressive, but the Loco is struggling to get up to speed. Normally, Nick's engine can get round this track without too much trouble, but he's carrying 16 passengers, and on this occasion, it looks as though his fire isn't quite right. And sure enough, after two laps... Nick backs his train down in order to get a better run of the climb. But he's not giving in. Nick is determined to finish this lap with all of his passengers on board. He's managed to restart, but his final blow up and sluggish pace has cost him valuable time. On his final lap, he's managed to build up some good speed, but it's too little too late. Nick crawls over the line with his engine having travelled the least distance of the competition, just 5,717 feet over three laps. But his decision to keep his passengers on board may have saved his place. The Dub D doesn't take top of the leaderboard, but it does put in an efficiency of 0.62% beating the Atlantic and all of the 3.5 inch gauge entries. From the Bracknell Railway Society comes one of the most unique locomotives of the competition, a Somerset and Dorset 7F280, the large boiler version, entered by service engineer Robert Hurst. This uh, locomotive was built by my father, Ivan Hurst, who is very well known in, in, the, uh, in the scene. Uh, I've had ownership of it now for the last three seasons and I was encouraged to uh, take part in today's competition. So how do you hope to get on? 
Well, I hope to make it round. Uh, and then anything else is a bonus. But will it be efficient? I'm not so sure. I mean, the 7F is a really impressive machine. It has a higher attractive effort than a Royal Scot. It has immense stopping abilities, and standing near one gives you the shivers. It has real stage presence. But a full-sized one also burns around 80 pounds of coal every mile. So, to be honest, I have my doubts. But then again, there's a Britannia and a B1 leading the competition without any breakdowns. So anything seems possible here. size 7F could reportedly reach speeds of 60 miles an hour, if the driver was brave enough. But with six passengers behind the observer, Robert's 7F blitzes round the track at a scale speed that seems even faster than that. In his 30-minute slot, Robert 7F has completed 10 laps covering 18,526 feet. But how efficient has his loco been? Let's have a look. And how's that for a surprise? Robert's done more than just get round. The 7F has tipped the B1 off the top of the leaderboard. Another freelancer, and it's another Poly. A Poly 6, this being the tender engine version. But does Derby representative Duncan Stagg have high hopes of beating the Poly 5? At its core, it's a Poly 6, um, with slight modifications. Um, so I've added a weir pump onto it and a few other bits. I put a light in the cab so that I can run at night because our club has quite a lot of interesting features and we do a lot of night runs. But it originally started because I got a, um, as a retirement project with me and my dad and it kind of went from there and then lockdown happened and everything and it kind of, kind of was the, um, well, a bit of an escape during that. And she would say, I finished, finished building her up over lockdown. I like to think it's unique even by poly standards. Um, which is what I like about them, you know, you've got lovely sta standard gauge stuff and models of the full size, but there's something about a freelance one that you can go, well, I want to do it like this, and just modify it to make it your own, yeah. just make it stand out a little bit more. Yeah. So how do you hope to get on today then? Well, this is my first time kind of competing in Imlec, or generally kind of running for any long extended period of time. Um, normally at our home club, uh, we kind of do maybe a lap or two laps, which is a mile in itself, so it's not a bad run, and it is a driver's track. There's lots of hills, tunnels, cuttings, so you can you never really can just sit back and enjoy. So it's going to be it's going to be interesting to see how she performs from my point of view.
Duncan's off to a brilliant start and is roaring along. But he's blowing his whistle an awful lot and wasting precious steam. His Polly clearly has steam to spare, but will he be able to keep the pressure up? Well, seven laps in, karma strikes. The coal has burned well, but it's finally clogged up his engine's tubes. Even with the blower on full blast, Duncan's Polly can't make enough steam. With time against him, Duncan decides that, after a spirited attempt, it's best to retire. Come on! Come on! Come on, girls! We the damn hill! But even in defeat, Duncan is determined that his engine will crawl home under its own power. He gave a good performance, but Duncan's Polly has wheezed out of the competition. The leaderboard remains unchanged. But for how long? The judges have allowed a gap in the proceedings so that Andrew Pope's S15 from earlier can have another go with the repaired dynamometer car. This time, Andrew blitzes round the track without stopping for any blow-ups. It's a stark contrast from earlier. He's putting in a good performance. Oh, but hang on a minute, what's this? Andrew's injectors have overheated. He's had to stop to pour cold water on them in order to get them working again. Crisis averted, the S15 restarts, but the pit stop has cost him valuable time. And he's done it. In 27 minutes and 33 seconds, he's managed to travel 13,156 feet on 1.27 pounds of coal. But he wasn't carrying any passengers, so his efficiency score is still very low. The three and a half inch gauge S15 finishes second to last. But at least he's finished his run. And in that sense, Andrew can claim a moral victory. Back to the 5-inch gauge prototypes now, with a Riddles 9F, built by another Chesterfield and District member, Dave Kerry. Evening stall, always is, if you like a favourite engine. And a friend of mine, he did the wrong thing, he sat me behind a little three and a half gauge one and just look back since then, so I blame him for all that. In steam days, 9Fs were known to reach speeds of up to 92 miles an hour. But again, it's not speed we're after. Introduced in 1954, the 9F was British Rail's final foray into steam technology. 251 members of this heavy freight class were built up until 1960, including the final steam locomotive built by BR. In 32 minutes and 33 seconds, Dave's 9F manages to take eight people around nine laps of the track on 2.58 pounds of coal. An impressive performance for a heavy freight machine. But it's not quite as impressive as the 7F from earlier. 
Dave's 9F has come in rather predictably behind Carl's Britannia. And wouldn't you know it, another Stania Duchess, City of Birmingham in 5 inch gauge, which is the nearest most of us will get to seeing City of Birmingham run in any gauge, entered by Paul Tomlinson. Right, this loco was built about 10 years ago and it's not run very much at all and about 18 months ago stripped it down totally, down to the last nut and bolt, rebuilt it, reworked it, added some scale detail and uh, painted it blue. Originally this one was green, but now in the uh, LMS blue livery. Um, the City of Birmingham still exists in the Think Tank Museum in Birmingham, so I've spent quite a lot of time on the real thing, measuring things up, and uh, the end result, well, looks good. Looks really good. So how do you hope to get on? If I can mid-table, I'll be happy. I'm here to take part, I mean the local club for me. I'm not here to win it, I just want to take part. This should be a good run. Paul's Duchess is on the same scale as Roger's A4, so it looks like there may finally be some Stania Gresley competition. Looking at the plume of steam coming from Paul's exhaust, it almost looks like it's performing like a full-sized Duchess. Paul's Duchess sets off to a promising start. But soon enough, the blow-ups begin. Two blow-ups down, it couldn't get much worse for Paul, could it? First a lack of steam, now it's a lack of lubrication that's Paul's problem. The valve gear has seized up solid. There's no choice but to drop the fire and carry the engine home on one of the trolleys. It's an ignominious end for such a graceful machine. What did I tell you about the colour? <laughs> Oh well, at least he tried, but City of Birmingham is out. The leaderboard remains the same. And so on with the competition. From Ermston and District comes a second Britannia, entered by mechanical engineering student Billy Stock from the University of Leeds. I bought it about three or four years ago, um, and me and my good friend John Holroyd have rebuilt all the valve gear, so got all the geometry right put clue pit rings, so piston rings on the um, bobbins and done a couple of other little tweaks to hopefully make it a bit more efficient. So how do you hope to get on today? Uh, I hope I have a good one and I just hope to finish really. There's more at stake here because Billy's Britannia was built from a kit made by Winson Engineering. Now Winson had this great idea in the late 90s to produce locos in kit form that you could assemble with no previous engineering experience required. It says here you could assemble a Britannia in kit form in less than 300 hours. But Winson's quality control was abysmal. The kits didn't go together properly, so you had to make extensive modifications if they were going to work at all. And sure enough, 40% of Billy's Britannia in kit form had to be thrown away. 
but when Billy ran his Britannia at the 2019 inlet competition, it finished in third place. So maybe Billy and his friend have succeeded in their shed where Winston failed in their factory. It's another brilliant Britannia run. He's carried fewer passengers than Carl's engine, but he's used less coal and covered an amazing 20,576 feet over 11 laps of the track. Will this be enough? Well, let's have a look and see what the judges worked out. I don't believe it. Billy's blown the 7F out of the water. 2.23% thermal efficiency. With five contestants to go, it's everything to play for here. The last Britannia down, and now from Leeds, the last B1, Wildebeest, entered by accountant Judith Bellamy. It was built by my father, Arthur Bellamy, um, over about 17 years, named after my mother, so my father tells me. Uh, there's a picture, I believe, in the program of it as the basic chassis and uh, the firebox, uh, sorry, the smoke box, and my brother's looking at it. My brothers are both older than me, they're both now retired and grandfathers, so that tells you how long it's how old it is. It has been reboiled about 10 years ago uh, and a bit of fettling, but it's not been run a great deal in the recent years. If I finish, I will be happy. It looks promising. But when Judith fired her engine up, it was losing steam faster than it was generating. There's a leak somewhere which may cause the engine to retire before it's even started. Oh, there's a gap around yeah, there. Yeah. Um, yeah, look, the door ain't shut in. It's not pulling up on the dark. Yeah. Huh? On close inspection, the smoke box door wasn't fully shutting. Air is escaping around the edge of the door, causing the drafting to fail. But, thankfully, yeah. there's a simple solution to the problem. You know what they say, if in doubt, hit it with a hammer. <laughs> yeah. We'll find out later if the repairs on Judith's B1 have worked. Meanwhile, the judges hurry the next contestant out to the track. For Great Western fans, don't worry. Here's the first of two Western entries today. A Hawksworth 1500 pannier tank, entered from Bracknell Railway Society member David Mayle. I bought it as a part-built chassis. Um, there was no plate work and that. The boiler I had to assemble and everything else. Um, it wasn't my first choice. I'm not a Great Western fan, but it just happened to come with a, something else. So um, I took it on from there and built it up and this is about the fourth, fifth engine I built. About 20 odd years old now. Original paintwork. But apart from that, she runs very well. How do you hope to get on in the inlay? <sighs> dare I, dare I call the gremlins in? Um, <laughs> I got pipped to the post last at Southport. I was second for three days, uh, first for three days, and just got pipped on the last last run. We'll see what the fates put, put for us today. The 1500 was one of the last developments of the Great Western pannier tank design, and perhaps the most radical. With outside valve gear and cylinders and an extended smoke box, only 10 were built to haul empty stock workings around Paddington. On this scale, the 1500 is popularly modelled and nicknamed the Speedy. But does speed equal efficiency in David's case?
10 laps completed with six people and 18,738 feet covered. David Speedy has certainly lived up to its name. And this is a surprise. He's only gone and shot into second place. Billy's Britannia is still ahead, but it's been given a good run for its money. Back with Judith's B1, the problems have been sorted. And after a top up with water and a last minute build up of the fire, the wildebeest is ready to run. But it seems a bit doddery. Normally, a two-cylindered loco, like a B1, exhales four equal chuffs of steam per wheel revolution. But Judith's engine seems to be exhaling all four chuffs in quick succession. Twice on its first lap, Wildebeest stalls and has to let off passengers in order to start again. But remember, once passengers are off, they can't get back on again. Sadly, before it can reach the top of the climb, Judith's engine has stopped performing altogether. But before it can build up enough steam to start off again, it's all over. The passengers pushing the trolleys along can only mean that Judith has decided to retire. The last ditch efforts to save the wildebeest were in vain, so things remain as they were. For the time being. Now onto one of the biggest tank engines here today, a Riddle Standard 4264. You generally can't go wrong with one of these in railway preservation, but will that help Southport MEC member and professional model engineer Ben Pavia achieve an efficient score? So, is this one you made yourself or uh, is this? This is a rebuild of a commercially available engine, so you can buy these off the shelf ready to run, where this one has had a complete mechanical overhaul. So all the bottom end bearings, axles, pins, bushes have been replaced. A lot of work to the cylinders, all to try and get a bit more performance out of it, uh, which has increased the distance it can travel on the water by sixfold, uh, which has been a you know, big improvement in the distance. Being able to make a lap without the water tanks emptying is uh, Quite, really, quite, quite makes it a confident drive now, yes. uh, which is what the, it's, I don't actually own it, this was rebuilt for a customer who's kind of let me bring it to the competition to run it. If I get top 10, I think I've done well, a bit, I, you know, uh, but for me it's finishing the 25 minutes. If you've, if you've finished a run, you've, you're a winner naturally yourself, rather than just trying to go for the trophy every time. Because it's quite nerve-wracking with everybody watching you at the same time, yeah. and you're you're shaking as you're going round and trying to concentrate on what's happening to the engine. Yeah. We've been in uh, a track that I have driven before, but not familiar with. Uh, you don't, and I don't really know the engine, so I don't know what's going to happen, how it's going to behave on the gradients and so on. So I'd probably take a light load and just try and complete the distance on as little coal as possible. He's only carrying three passengers, so let's see how the standard tank gets on.
14,984 feet across 28 and a half minutes. Will the all-singing, all-dancing standard tank be as efficient as it is purposeful on heritage lines? Mm, nope, not even close to the top. Ben's standard burned a surprising 2.26 pounds of coal. It turns out the WD, P1, 9F and 7F performed better on this occasion. Better luck next time, Ben. Two more contestants to go, and it's still all to play for. Following up from Chesterfield's performances, it's up to John Cottam to achieve efficiency with his LNE RP2, with the A4 styled Bugatti nose. Well, it's the uh, third engine that I've built. I built a Britannia, and then a Merchant Navy, and then I decided that uh, I'll build this. It's one that I've always liked, and my grandmother was from Scotland, and this used to run very near to where she lived. The choice was made when I got a calendar uh, for New Year's Eve 2007, and on the calendar was this locomotive, so that was choice made. I just hope to do well. I've done well before, so try and do well again. The P2 should do well here. Three cylinders and eight large driving wheels should provide a good balance of speed and power. But will John's 12 passengers slow him down? Watch this. Perhaps the most famous Gresley locomotives not to survive into preservation, the six P2282s were ordered for hauling express passenger trains from Edinburgh to Aberdeen. Wolf of Badenoch, built in 1936, was the last of the Hexad, and following a rebuild in the 1940s, was withdrawn and scrapped in 1961. But if John's engine is anything to go by, the P2s were certainly fast. And lively too. Just look at the way the engine bounces and sways around at speed. Too much bouncing, and John's engine could jump off the track if he's not careful. Well, John's P2 put in a spectacular performance, but... Oh, it was so close to David Mayle's score, but it seems on this occasion, Gresley wasn't right. And so, it's all down to this. From the Leyland Society of Model Engineers, a Great Western 5101 large prairie tank, entered by retired BT engineer, Alan Crossfield. I started it about 2001, completed 2005, and um, I've been passenger hauling with it since then on my local track uh, at Leyland in Lancashire. Um, it's a simplified version of the, the original plan by Kevin Shortland. Yeah. So how do you hope to get on? Uh, I hope, hope to complete the course and get all my passengers back to the station. <laughs> <laughs> without, without what most people can ask for, I expect. Without them having to walk. <laughs> Great Western built 306 large prairies between 1903 and 49 across seven variants. Allen's example is one of the 5101 type, which had curved frames in front of the cylinders instead of straight ones.
but after a few laps, he's beginning to struggle. He's had to stop for a blow up just before the summit. Progress picks up again, but by lap 6 his progress doesn't last. This time he stands still for so long that when he sets off again, he's in danger of eating into his extra time. And that's it, it's all over. Alan's taken six people along 11,241 feet in 32 minutes and 18 seconds. But how did his prairie get on? Well, he's come in fourth, and he's burned the least amount of coal in the five inch gauge lineup, just under one and a quarter pounds. So it turns out right at the last minute, both Western entries have ended up in the top five. And that signals the end of the competition. Everybody started, but sadly, some of our contestants didn't finish. Nevertheless, we've seen some spirited entries from Matt Butler's B1, Harry Wilcox's Netta, Duncan Stagg's Polly Six, Paul Tomlinson's Stania Duchess, and Judith Bellamy's Wildebeest. Thankfully, 19 entries did finish. So, in last but by no means losing place, Steve Harrison from Birmingham with his 3.5 inch gauge Doris. In 18th place, Andrew Pope from Southport with his 3.5 inch gauge S15. Bringing up the rear of the 5 inch gauge entries, John Williams with his barely completed Monsell U Class Mogul. Ahead of John in 16th place is railway engineer Danny Haywood with his 3.5 inch gauge Netta. Only just ahead of Danny in 15th place is Paul Tompkins with his 3.5 inch gauge Duchess, City of Chester. In 14th place, the North British Railway Atlantic from Beechhurst. 13th may be debatable over luck, but it was Dave Shepard's engine management that got his Poly 5 around the track. 12th place goes to professional model engineer Ben Pavia with his standard 4 tank. Nick Taylor takes 11th place with his 5 inch gauge Dub D, Kitchener. Entering the top 10 is Jeff Moore with his LNER Gresley P1. Just pipping Jeff to the post is Roger Holland with his A4 Pacific Wild Swan. In 8th place, the 5 inch gauge 9F Evening Star from Dave Kerry. 7th place goes to Britannia Pacific Apollo from Andy Healy for the late Carl Midgley. Sixth place goes to the only B1 that managed to complete the contest, Springbok from Marcus Peel. At the top of the top five, surely the real surprise for this year, the 7F280 from Robert Hurst. Fourth place goes to Alan Crossfield with his Great Western Large Prairie Tank. In third place, the bronze runner-up is the highest scoring three-cylinder engine of the competition, the 5-inch gauge LME RP2 from John Cotton. In second place, the silver runner-up is the Great Western 1500 pannier tank from David Mayle. But the winner of the 2021 International Model Locomotive Efficiency Competition is 5-inch gauge Britannia Pacific number 70030 William Wordsworth, entered by Billy Stock.
But to be honest, it wasn't really much of a competition. Not because the winning engine superseded the others, but because the competitors weren't in it for the top prize. Everyone taking part, whether they got round the track or not, was here simply because they wanted to be here. Whether they disintegrated, retired, ran out of steam or slipped to a stand, every competitor put on a great show. And regardless of their performance, every contestant showed that, even when scaled down, the power of steam can unite the masses regardless of politics, religion, age, gender or anything that segregates society. Maybe that's what competitions like these tell us most of all, that no matter what scale it's in, railway enthusiasm is like no other pastime out there.